Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we're offering five conversations from Season 3, Episode 44, our preview of the Parish Nash and Naffold Summit conferences, plus from the vault, a section from our 2021 Paris Nash Review episode. Before we start, I would be remiss not to express condolences and sadness over the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Like nine-tenths of the world population, she was the British monarch from the day I was born until now, and always felt to me like a source of stability and good measure in a rapidly, chaotically transformed forming world. Now she belongs to the ages, where I suspect history will treat her with kindness and respect, and our friends in the UK and the Commonwealth and everyone in the world who loved and respected her will have her memory with us. And on to discuss the conversation. This week, our conversation from The Vault comes from Season 2, Episode 59, with Jeff Lazarus discussing his recently published paper titled Advancing the Global Public Health Agenda for NAFLD, on which Jorn Schottenberg was also a co-author. This conversation is the back end of that episode. In large part, it focuses on what will happen next in NAFLD and NASH, why NAFLD is the canary in the coal mine for other metabolic diseases, and how we can combine strengths in different parts of the world to make all our programs more robust. For Jeff, what's next includes a third, smaller Delphi study, as well as greater focus on sustainable development goals around the environment, diet, possibly exercise. As the conversation continues, Stephen Harrison discusses ways to persuade patients and perhaps medical societies to change habits, practices, and beliefs radically to fight this disease. Louise Campbell returns to the issue of SDGs to discuss how advocates can leverage the increasing volume of liver cancer patients to represent larger related issues. This leads Jeff Lazarus to comment on how prevalent and costly liver cancer is today compared to other cancers. In the end, Stephen Harrison recommends a two-item impact strategy. Clear messages supported richly through large, high-impact multimedia campaigns. Two-item impact strategy. First, clear messages. And second, support them richly through large, high-impact multimedia campaigns. Listening to this conversation reminded me of how much progress our community is making on holistic integrated treatment approaches and insights, even in the absence of an improved medication. It's inspiring. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn. When you're done, join the dialogue on our LinkedIn discussion group. For everybody who's listening, it's the middle of October. Leaves are turning all over the Northern Hemisphere. Jorn Schottenberg, who's with us today, says it's not quite as interesting in Germany as it is on the East Coast of the U.S., but I can't believe that's true. And we are here with what I think is really an exciting program. Uh, Scott Friedman from outside, Dr. Scott Friedman, is joining us today. Scott, how are you today? I'm terrific. Pleased to be with you, Roger. Thrilled to have you here. Fun fact for our audience before we get started. The little 12-minute conversation, the number is 46.2, that uh, Jorn and Stephen recorded talking about the session that Scott and Lars Johansson, who was with us last week, and I forget who the third speaker was, did at Paris Nash. That's the second fastest growing piece we've ever posted, over 200 pieces, followed only by the FDA webcast podcast after January 31st. And it's the first time in the history of this podcast that a conversation, a snippet, has grown faster than the entire episode. So, Scott, Lars, wherever you are today, Jorn, Steven, you guys are to be commended. That just hasn't happened yet, and you made it happen. Congratulations for that. With that, we have a lot of ground to cover. We're going to start by talking about some things that came out of Paris Nash, and then we're just going to let this conversation go. Scott has an exceptional depth and breadth of knowledge. And as you know from listening, whenever you have Jorn and Stephen and Louise, you get lots of questions. So we should be in for a good time. Scott, let me start with you since you've not been on the podcast before. Take a couple of minutes, please. Tell everyone a little bit about yourself, your history, how you got to be where you are today. And then at the end of that, one fun fact that people would not know about you if you didn't tell them on this podcast. The floor is yours, my friend. Great to be here, guys. And Louise. So I am, I guess, by any measure, a traditional academic physician. I didn't start out that way exactly. My dad was a doctor. My brother is a doctor, actually an MD, PhD, and I wanted to be a doctor. I fell in love with liver disease in the second year of med school when I was here at Mount Sinai in New York, and that really stuck with me as often these early imprints have on your career choices. I did my internal medicine residency at Boston's Beth Israel Hospital and then moved west to UCSF to do GI and liver because they're usually combined in a single training program, and I had never done any research. I did go to UCSF thinking I wanted to try research, but in the most naive of ways, I wanted to study something that had to do with patients I'd been taking care of up till that point in my career. Joined the lab by a wonderful man who's still very active, Monty Bissell at UCSF, and I chose the lab, one, because of Monty, which proved to be a terrific choice, but secondly, because he was studying something that nobody believed was really interesting or treatable, and that was scarring or fibrosis of the liver. I could relate to that as 
a clinician, I knew that patients ended up getting into trouble with liver disease of any type, including fatty liver disease, because they got scarring. And so I figured, well, it'd be kind of interesting to study the cells that make scar. The only problem was I started by studying the wrong cells. The cells that I was studying that everybody said were the cell are the workhorse of the liver known as the hepatocyte, the epithelial cell of the liver. And so Monty had developed methods to isolate hepatocytes, and I followed those methods. I grew hepatocytes in early culture dishes from rats. I kept trying to stimulate them with growth factors, and I could flog them now until, you know, whenever, and they just didn't make a lot of scar, a lot of collagen. And so I was about six months into this and figuring what my career was going to look like now that I'd failed at research. Took a relook and realized that there was a lot of circumstantial data or evidence that suggested there was a cell type in the liver, then known as the ETO cell or the fat storing cell, that seemed to always be where the action was if you did a microscopic slide of the liver. And there was always scar around these cells. One nice feature of the cell type that became the hook to study them is that they are the main storage site in the body for vitamin A, which is stored as retinal esters, so as fatty acid compounds. And so we reasoned that if we dissolve the liver skeleton and isolate cells, we could separate these cells simply because they were more buoyant, because they had fat. And that simple, educated guess led us to develop the first really good method for isolating hepatic stellate cells, first from rat and then from the humans and other species as well, mouse in particular. And that really opened the door. It was a new model, a new tool, and anything we asked had never been asked before in the cell type. Do the cells make collagen? Do they grow in culture? Do they make growth factors? How do they regulate their production of scar? And that has frankly been my obsession for the better part of the last 40 years. We still study how that cell works. Now, interestingly enough, we published our paper in a very good journal, thanks to Monty and uh, another senior mentor, a man named Rudy Schmidt. We published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. I was expecting a brass band to walk into the lab the day that was published, announcing the great discovery, and nothing happened. And nothing happened for a few years. And slowly, people started to catch on to the idea that maybe this was a cell type worthy of study. And you know, truth be told, it is. These are the cells that make the scar that lead to fibrosis and cirrhosis. No fibrosis, no end-stage liver disease, no liver cancer, or very little liver cancer. Of course, the science has transitioned, so it went from very simple culture studies to understanding how the cells are regulated through a variety of things and ultimately defining molecules that represent targets for new drugs to block fibrosis in liver and, as it turns out, relevant to scarring diseases in other organs like lung, kidney, skin, bone marrow, brain, and heart. And they all are affected to some extent or other in many cases with scarring. In fact, it's estimated that 45% of all the deaths in the industrialized world are due to scarring diseases of one organ or another, including liver. So it's been a hell of a ride when you're a physician investigator, and I don't have a PhD, by the way, I never got one because I came to lab research too late. But when you are a physician scientist and you end up studying something that genuinely could impact on patients' lives, that's as good as it gets. So I like to say I'm, I'm living in the bonus round now. I'm so far beyond what I ever hoped to accomplish in my career and in my research that this is all gravy and I'm just enjoying the ride tremendously. You know, we have a fantastic community of investigators, both in the fibrosis and stellate cell world, but more broadly, people like Stephen and Yorn and others in the fatty liver disease space. And one of the things I've written about in a retrospective of my career some years ago, which I'm happy to share with you, is that hepatologists are a nice bunch of people. So if you stick around in this field, the phenotype of people who choose to study liver, particularly in the old days when we had no treatments, typically these were people who were thoughtful, cognitive, liked to work on teams, were very modest, generous, non-judgmental, And these are still the traits that define our special. So for all kinds of reasons, I'm having the time of my life doing exactly what I could have hoped to do, uh, only more and better. That's fantastic. And do you have one fact you can share with us that we wouldn't know if you didn't tell us? Virtually nobody knows this, but they will hopefully now. I played in the house band of the Israeli Day Parade March when I was in high school. So I'm a trombonist and I played trombone. I had a teacher who was pretty well known in the professional trombone circles in New York. He was in the union. He couldn't make this gig and he asked me if I could sit in for him. And so there I was on Fifth Avenue at the reviewing stand. And the parade still happens every year, except for the pandemic. And they still have a house band, as far as I know. And there I was playing all these Israeli folk marches as the crowds went by on Fifth Avenue. Fortunately, I chose not to make a living playing trombone. So I think uh, I chose wisely. So I, I have to tell you, I think that's top 10 material. And we've got <laughs> 80 or 90 of these by now. And I think that goes really high on the list. What do you think, uh, Louise, Stephen? 
top 10 material? Most definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> like at NLC one year, we should just bring a trombone just to see if you could, you know, play a few chords uh, for us. Not unless you want to empty the room in a real hurry. <laughs> Actually, and, and by the way, if that doesn't do it, you can bring a tuba. I'll sit in with him. In between us, we will absolutely empty the room. Well, the I, I will tell you something interesting. Roger and I share, having grown up in the same generation on Long Island, and my high school, Eula High School, had a fantastic music program, and a striking number of people were drawn into professional music careers. My best buddy next to me on trombone was a guy who I lost touch with. His name was Douglas Yo, and I rekindled our friendship when I saw him on PBS playing with the Boston Pop on the Washington Mall for July 4th. Doug was, because he's retired now from the Boston Symphony, he was the most elite bass trombone player in the world. And I can assure you that he made the right decision with his career. And hearing Doug play, I made the right decision with mine. <laughs> <laughs> and we're still good friends, by the way. Well, you've done well with your career choice. I would definitely have to give you props for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks. Appreciate so, that. Scott, Stephen has described you, I think, both off and maybe even on the podcast as the father of fibrosis. And everybody hearing this, I think, understands why. So with that, let me uh, ask everyone else to just say hi and check in, go around. Uh, one good thing has happened in the past week. Uh, Brave One, go first. That's an easy one for me. I'm going to start, Roger, and make it quick so we have more time to chat about the fascinating science behind Scott's am amazing career. And I'm going to share that I just came back from a short fall break in southern Germany with the kids, and we had a great time taking some days off the clinic. And I'm back here online with you guys. Looking forward to this uh, episode. Thanks, Huron. Uh, for, for brevity and and uh, good news, that's fantastic. Someone can top that. I'll jump in next. My good thing of the week is I'm about to get on a flight to Portugal. So I'll be doing a podcast from Portugal next week. It's the first time since the pandemic was declared. So I'm very happy. I don't have a lot of news to say, except it was another win for my alma mater. Ole Miss took down uh, Tennessee in football this weekend, despite the end of the game being a debacle with everything from water bottles to golf balls being thrown onto the field. Who brings a golf ball to a football game? I don't understand this, but anyway. A knucklehead, I think, is the yeah. answer. What a crazy Saturday night. If Scott went to a knucklehead, I went to somebody who's had too much to drink, and we're probably both right. <laughs> so, okay, then, I guess my good news is really simple. It was my anniversary weekend. We went to Cape May, which we love, and where we got married and just had a fantastic time, maybe the best of the 21 that we've had. So, with that, let me turn back to my colleague, Dr. Dr. Harrison, just talk a little bit about the Paris NAS session in question and, and Scott and to tee up Scott to get going. Sure. Your floor, Stephen. Yeah, so thank you. And and a special thanks to Scott for joining us as kind of a follow-on to having Lars on last week. And I can't think of a conference I've been to virtually or in person in the past several years where I walked away from the conference just amazed at the work that's being done in this field. And you would you'd think that would be double ASLD or easel and not a smaller conference like even NASHTAG or, or the Paris NASH Summit. But I was blown away by the session on fibrosis. And I may not have even, as much as I like you, Scott, I'm not sure I would have been as attentive to your session had Arun not asked me to moderate the session. So it's, it's a special thank you to Arun Sanyal for focusing my attention on that one section of the meeting. I, I owe him a debt of gratitude because it was amazing. The three lectures, one from a pathologist, of course, and then Lars, we heard from last week, and then Scott's, were just phenomenal. And just to set the stage for this, what I spend my life doing is working on new drugs for NASH and, and non-invasive tests to help identify NASH and monitor response to therapy and predict outcomes. I'm always being put in a situation where I kind of give an update on the future of NASH therapies, emerging therapies, and we talk about the current mechanisms of action and how potentially that's going to lead to combination therapy and how we put the right drugs together to synergize and give us a better result for NASH resolution and fibrosis improvement, and ideally both, as well as improving the extrahepatic manifestations of disease. But really, where I guess I was not thinking was so much on how precision medicine could really help speed that process of emerging therapies up, or maybe allow us to be more individualized in our approach to therapy for this multifaceted, uh, multifactorial, complicated, and dynamic disease that we we call NASH. And, and so as I began to think about 
this a bit more and listen to Scott's talk. It has been an eye-opener for me that there's a whole new world that we're just beginning to unravel, whether it's uh, therapeutic oligonucleosides, genetic modification, the microbiome, or potentially this CAR-T therapy. These have the potential to be real game changers, whether they're used in isolation or in combination with some of the drugs we're currently developing. It opens a whole new playing field. And Scott's presentation, I don't think I'll ever quit talking about it. It was fascinating. I'm just blessed beyond belief that you're willing to come on and share with us a little bit about what you, you're researching, what you know about fibrosis as far as modulating that, your work you've done with senolytic stellate cells and senescence and, and modifying that, all that that you spoke about. And that's just a little piece of it is fascinating. And you can explain it in a way that even people like me can understand, which I think is another feather in your cap that you can take a very complicated topic and make it easy to understand. So thank you for coming on today. Stephen, you humble me with your praise and I'm grateful to be here. I only wish my mother was alive to hear it. No kidding. So um, maybe I'll amplify the theme of precision medicine and talk about how it intersects with gene therapy and some of the newer techniques around stellate cells. Actually, S Steve was kind enough to not only include me in the Paris Nash program, but also in his NLC. And I gave two separate lectures, one in the National Liver Conference was on precision medicine, and the one in Paris was on really about stellate cell heterogeneity. And Stephen and Arun Sanyal, who was the main organizer of the Paris Nash, always managed to pick topics I feel like I'm deficient in. And there's no better way to motivate yourself to get up to speed than to have to talk about it publicly or even in a conference. So I've had some time to reflect on both those topics and where they intersect. Precision medicine just strictly speaking, is the right treatment or diagnostic for the right patient at the right time. That's the ultimate goal. But clearly, there's a lot more embedded in that. And the precision comes in different elements of human health and disease. It comes in terms of the genetics, that is, what their genes encode, what variants change the behavior of the proteins that they encode, some of which is linked to their ethnicity, and that's particularly important in NASH and particularly in regions like the one where Steve practices, where Latin Americans have a higher prevalence of a a particular gene variant that predisposes them to fatty liver disease and NASH and alcoholic liver disease. So there's the genetics precision element. There's the genes, and I'm not talking only about the genes that are being expressed as proteins in our bodies, but also the genes that are being expressed by the bugs in our microbiota. So that's really one of the hottest and most fascinating topics there is. This unbelievable realization that with the trillion bacteria that we carry around in our bodies, that they're not just lying around doing nothing. They're influencing so many elements of disease, disease risk, disease pathogenesis, disease treatment. You know, you can ask, well, we knew bacteria were in the colon, for example, for a long, long time. Why now in the 21st century or in 2021 are we beginning to think about the microbiome more intensively? And really the part of the reason has to do with technology. That is, we now have the capacity to define or to assess the actual sequence of the bacterial genome, find out how that leads to changes in what the bacteria do and how those changes may change the way the bugs interface with the human tissue that they reside around, particularly in the gut. You know, when Steve and I were, and probably Jorn as well, when we were medical students, and I'm older than these two youngsters, when we were medical students, the way you defined what a bug was and what it did is what media did it grow on? So you were trying to find out what kind of bacteria. Well, it grew on chocolate agar and it didn't grow on this agar and it grew on that agar. It was really primitive. And now we can sequence the bugs. This technological revolution that we're more familiar with in the context of sequencing the human genome has had an equally transformative effect on our understanding of bacterial biology and how it interfaces with the human immune system and human health and disease. So there's another element of precision. And then the other element of precision is the precision of therapies, therapies that are a guided missile to target either getting a drug into a specific cell, or in the case of CAR T cells, which I'll explain in just a minute, are actually a designer cell that seeks out only certain molecules expressed on certain cells and either kills those cells or modifies them in the case of CAR-T. So the precision is just breathtaking. Uh, now I want to zero in a little bit on the precision around the gene expression in stellate cells. So if you remember from my introductory comments, my obsession is this wonderful cell type in the liver known as the stellate cell. I should digress and say, by the way, when I came into the field, every continent had their own pet name for the cell. So the Japanese called it the Ito cell, the Germans called it the fat-storing cell, the um, Dutch called it the 
perisinusoidal cell, and the Americans called it the lipocyte. So my first paper described lipocytes, but they were all the same cell type. One other fun fact is that in 1992, I got so fed up with having to write all the synonyms for the cell types in articles that I actually mounted a faxing campaign because we didn't have email in 92. So I sent around a fax to everybody who'd ever published in the field, and I said, look, this is insane. Let's standardize the name. I propose we choose the name that was originally assigned to it by the German pathologist in the 1800s, Kupfer, who called them Sternzellen, which Jorn can translate, but I think it means star-like cells. I was further saying, I'm not trying to stick to my name. In fact, I have to change the name too. And so with a couple of grumpy curmudgeons, except for them, whose names shall remain anonymous, everybody said, yeah, it's a good idea. And so now we call them Stellar cells. So let me return to the idea of precision and, and Stellar cells, because what I talked about in the session that Stephen chaired in Paris, by the way, Stephen, I think one of the reasons that meeting was so exceptional was just the sheer joy of being in person at a meeting with our colleagues, which for me was the first time. So we were a little bit high on humors of goodwill and friendship that were circulating around that room after such a long time of Zoom deprivation. But I talked about the power of these technologies in now collecting and sequencing genes from individual cells and, and, and then adding them up to create effectively a, a painting, if you will, almost like, I guess I never thought of it this way, like a Surat painting, you know, pointillist painting where every dot represents a single cell. Instead of just mixing up the liver and mashing it up and saying, well, all the genes that are expressed in this big gamish of liver are this, that, and the other, we can now say, well, this cell is expressing these genes and that cell is expressing those genes. And that has been, as I mentioned, I think in my lecture, the most transformative technology in my career since the advent of polymerase chain reaction or PCR, which obviated the need for some very tedious techniques like RNA's protection in northern blot for those cognoscenti in the field. Single cell gene sequencing and single cell transcriptomics has been stunningly informative in telling us what every single cell in the liver is doing in terms of the genes they express. Uh, the speaker who gave a wonderful overview, Prakash Ramachandran, who had the first and in many ways still the best paper of single cell sequencing in fibrotic human liver, had a wonderful metaphor. He showed a fruit smoothie with multiple fruits that had been blended together and had this kind of nice, presumably nice aroma, but it had a nice purplish color. But it didn't tell you which fruits and in what amounts went into that fruit smoothly after it had been in the blender. But instead, if you took little bowls of individual fruits and said, these are all the ingredients, that's effectively what single cell sequencing provides, is how every single dot in the Surat painting or every fruit in the smoothie actually contributed the overall flavor. That's a wonderful metaphor. You actually went one step further. There's a, an even further refinement on the technique of single cell transcriptomics, which is that you can actually visualize the individual genes and the individual cells in a slice of tissue under the microscope, and that's called spatial transcriptomics. And there he analogized that if I mix the fruit in a certain pattern within a bowl, you can actually see where the fruit lie, not just how many of them are and what color they are. What has that meant for us stellate cell geeks? Well, it's meant that we can now not just reinforce what we knew, that the stellate cells are important for fibrosis and they become more important as injury to the liver progresses, but also that there are different subtypes of stellate cells that subserve different functions. And that leads us to the CAR T cell story that Steve and Jorn had talked about in your previous podcast, which is that there is this spectacular technology created by a number of great labs. Carl June is often recognized as one of the fathers of CAR T therapy. And it's a way of taking a T cell that has the power, a little factory in the power to destroy target cells and engineering that T cell so that it hones in on a protein of interest in your target cell. Why is that important for stellate cells? Well, it turns out that there's a subset of stellate cells that we barely recognized before that have these features of senescence, which are simply put, they're kind of old age cells, but really there's much more to it. And nonetheless, there's good data to suggest that this very small fraction of stellate cells that are senescent are really the baddest of the bad actors. And if you could get rid of those and leave the other stellate cells to do their thing, and particularly to support liver function, you'd really have literally a guided missile. And work done by Scott Lowe and Michelle Satellite and Sloan Kettering, and I give them all the credit. I was involved in the project, but really from a perspective of the context and the models that they were using. And they designed CAR T cells for a very specialized purpose and for the first time showed that you can use these guided missiles not just to target cancer cells for which CAR T cells were originally developed, but rather you can use them to target these subsets of senescent stellate cells, thereby clearing these bad of the baddest actors and allowing the liver to heal more readily and improve its function. And this is just the beginning. You know, I, I can tell you the prospect of using CAR-Ts 
for non-cancer diseases like fibrosis is something that's very realistic. It will take a while to sort out because clearly we want a Goldilocks effect. We want to take out just the right number of cells of the right type and not all the cells. And if we're successful at that, we may have yet another treatment. Lots of questions ahead of us for that particular challenge. But nonetheless, you know, my comments really illustrate the power of these new technologies and the doors that they open for the first time that give us a three-dimensional vista that was unimaginable even 10 years ago. Thanks, Scott, first of all, for that remarkably learned and far-ranging and at the same time really, really clear explanation of a lot of important topics all at once. I'm going to turn to my colleagues, Dr. Schottenberg and Dr. Harrison and Ms. Campbell, and ask which one of you guys has the first question. I'll just share you my thoughts quickly when Scott was talking, detailing this, and then maybe uh, Stephen can follow up. By the technologies that Scott mentioned, we're able to paint a micro picture of the cirrhotic or the pre cirrhotic liver and understand better how much diversity is, potentially is, or could be, and how much of that diversity we have to potentially address in patients. It gives us an idea on why certain drugs might or might not work in a subset of patients, why we have responders and non-responders. There's much more, if you're trying to transfer that into the clinical context of a patient responding or not responding to drug or having this cause of his liver disease or the other cause, this could be really one of the breakthrough observations. I'm still trying to put my mind around how the complexity of this is just so high. So I guess my first question to Scott is very straightforward, is how do I integrate that in a single patient for then turning this to a better outcome or applying a right drug? If you have so many signals, how do you identify the relevant signal for these patients? How could we use this technology from your perspective, Scott? Uh, really good question, Jorn. And the answer is partly known and partly wishful thinking. The part that's known are things like pharmacogenomics. I think they're going to be laughing at us in another 20, maybe 40 years and how we prescribe medications. We say, oh, you know, you have this symptom or you have this disease. It could be something in the liver. It could be inflammatory bowel disease. And you have this disease. We're going to try drug A because that works in a lot of people. Oh, drug A didn't work. Let's try drug B. But now, even inflammatory bowel disease and more importantly in drug metabolism, we can actually define by assessing gene expression what drugs should work in the case of IBD, what drugs are going to be effectively metabolized or may be toxic in the case of pharmacogenomics. You know, the pharmacogenomics is the here and now. There are some drugs where if you have certain variants of drug metabolizing genes in your liver, which is where most metabolism occurs, then you should stay away from that drug or you should double the dose or you should find an alternative. Pharmacogenomics is here and now. Things more like precision therapy for subsets of either liver disease or IBD, we're still effectively laying down the cobblestones to build a road to greater truth. I think in the case of IBD, we're getting closer, uh, but that may also be true in NAFLD. So one of the things that we all labor under is the idea that everybody who has the same fatty liver pattern under the microscope has the same disease. And that may be naive. It may be that there are subtypes or what sometimes are called endophenotypes, so that even though the patient has the same microscopic picture of their liver, one patient may have gotten there because there's insulin resistance that's driving a lot of the damage. Others may have more oxidant stress or reactive oxygen molecules that damage tissues. Others yet may have sensitivity to toxic lipids. If we don't know that those are three different patients with three different disease drivers, and it's no surprise that one size will not fit all in terms of trying a drug. And that may be one of the reasons why the best we can do in the drugs that are being tested now for NASH is somewhere between 20 to, at best, 50% of the patients may be responding. And that's, at best, probably closer to 25 or so. Um, so we need that kind of precision information, Jorn, to help define subtypes of disease that may be amenable to specific treatments. But we have a long, long way to go. There is one other point, and I made it in the lecture I gave to Steve's conference in Texas, which is the last thing clinicians want to have to do when they're seeing a new patient in 30 minutes and a follow-up patient in 10 or 15 minutes, which is typical in our institution. The last thing they want to have to do is go interrogate their genetic information and decide what drug or what subtype of a disease they have. And so there is an ambitious effort, an international effort to develop the software to take all of that massive information and filter it and distill it down to actionable information so that when you're seeing your patient with the electronic medical record in front of you, the EMR will tell you, Dr. Harrison, your patient has this or that enzyme phenotype or this or that subtype of NASH based on his or her gene expression in their blood or in their tissue. This is the recommended drug for your patient now in your practice. And it has to really distill it down to that because we can't expect busy clinicians to suddenly become geneticists or pharmacologists. There's a universe of information and technology being developed to effectively translate complex genetic information 
information into actionable decision making at the point of care at the clinic outside or at the bench in practice. My mind is racing with so many questions, Scott, as I hear you talk. You know, just free association, just things that are coming to my mind. I mean, we talk about balloon hepatocytes being essentially dysfunctional hepatocytes that that trigger activation of stellate cells. Is this stellate cells in senescence or these senolytic stellate cells? Could we call them like the equivalent of a balloon hepatocyte? Is it like a senolytic stellate cell is a bad of the bad actor, if you will? Should we be, now that we know what they are, and we, now that we know that if we were to reverse engineer this and we could use CAR-T therapy to identify these cells, is there a way we can identify a population of patients where this is a predominant player in fibrogenesis? And if so, could we target drugs, not necessarily CAR-T therapy, but I wonder if some of our current drugs are behaving differently against this cell type. Is it's just a bevy of questions to ask. Is there a genetic polymorphism that could link to a higher proportion portion of these cells, like PNPLA3 links to more fat, leads to more NASH. Is there a genetic polymorphism that links to a higher percentage of senolytic cells in a NASH patient? Terrific question. Answer unknown. Part of the answer, actually, you already gave away without realizing it. So the PNPLA3, which is uh, PNPLA3 is a gene that stands for patatin-like phosphatase 3. It came out of an unbiased genetic study of Helen Hobbs and her group at UT Southwestern some years ago. Patients who have a particular variant and PNPLA3 are at higher risk of developing NASH if they are obese. And that's important because lean patients with the risk polymorphism don't seem to have as heightened a risk. It's when you get obese. But it turns out that while most of the effort has studied how that gene variant affects injury to hepatocytes, it turns out that the PN, like every gene, it's expressed in more than one cell. It turns out that when PNPLA3 variant is expressed in stellate cells, those cells are more fibrogenic. So it begs the question, maybe we should be thinking about variants that are affecting not just the way that target of the injury, the hepatocyte is responding, but also what is downstream of that injured hepatocyte? In other words, what are the signals that are emanating from that injured cell that are saying, get here and help me make more inflammation, make some scar, let's mount some defense against this. I think we're going to see a growing list of gene variants that are affecting more than just the hepatocyte. We just have to look for them. In terms of the ballooned hepatocyte, I do need to make one small correction for your listeners, Stephen, the strict term would be senescent cells. Senolytic is a therapy, whether it's a cell or a chemical that kills senescent cells, and that we would certainly want to use senolytics towards senescent stellate cells. Are they like balloon hepatocytes? Well, in a way, although, you know, I think to our best guess is that balloon hepatocytes are a special kind of injured hepatocytes that's releasing a lot of dangerous fatty toxic lipids. So that's leading to the signals. The stellate cell is this poor reactive cell that's saying, "Uh uh-oh, I'm seeing all these signals, time to wake up, activate and make some scar to protect this tissue. So they're kind of a yin-yang where one provides the signals, the other is, re- is the responder cell. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. That that makes sense. If if you were to look to the future, do you see a day where we could easily assess by imaging this cell type? Well, yes, the short answer. The longer answer is uh, I actually, I thought about this about 20 years ago and filed a patent which was issued but could never so-called reduce it to practice practice and others are doing better at that in later day. That is, if activated stellate cells or better yet, senescent stellate cells are expressing particular molecule on the outside of the cell, that becomes a ready target for uh, imaging agents that can bind to that. And there have been and are efforts to administer a binding agent. It could be a radioisotope. It could be uh, an MR contrast agent, but that also has a guided missile attached to it that will direct it only to that molecule on those cells. And we recently years ago, and I think it's still true, that if you could quantify the mass, the number of activated fibrogenic stellate cells, that that would be a pretty good surrogate for how much scar the liver is likely to be making. So there are imaging methods already in animals, some great work done over the years by Peter Caravan, who's up at Mass General, but others as well, quite a number from China and throughout Asia that are using different molecules to guide imaging molecules to specific cell types, in particular stellate cells. I mean, if we could just take that and relate this back to drug development, where we're looking to find a drug that changes how people feel, function, and survive, and and we can link it to an outcome. I wonder if we could measure these cells and use it as a surrogate for portal hypertension. Spleen size, spleen volume, all link very nicely to HVPG 
And I, to me, this is an area that's just ripe for investigation and has a direct link back to drug development. Amen, brother. We are yoked to pathology, which was a powerful tool in the late 19th and to the mid 20th century. And we are now being held back by our insistence that we do liver biopsies and look under the microscope at these different features that tell us how the patient is doing. And while they are certainly informative, first of all, we can get a lot more information out of a liver biopsy than simply what the pathologist tells us, meaning we can evaluate that liver tissue using AI-driven or artificial intelligence-driven machine learning to quantify every dot and pixel and pattern in that liver tissue in a way that no human eye could ever amass. So if we do biopsies, we need to do a whole lot better in capturing that information. But remember, and you know this very well, Stephen Yorn, that the, the liver biopsy at the end of the day is what's called a surrogate. We don't really care if the liver biopsy looks better, if the patient doesn't live longer, feel better, or have improved health. So we're laboring under this existing paradigm because we haven't validated our methods where you have to see the biopsy improve and hope that the biopsy improvement in 2021 will mean that in 2025 and 2030, that that patient, if they're still on the drug, will actually live longer and better. As Steve knows well, there is currently a drug development or approval path where the FDA is willing to consider approving drugs under what's called the subpart H authorization, where they say, well, we hope or we will approve this drug because the biopsy improved, but you guys better show us that that biopsy improvement ultimately led to the more important issues of how the patient feels, functions, and survives over a longer term. Very interesting. Quick follow-up question, Scott. If you're connecting these changes to outcome, which I think is a critical path forward to use it in the future, should we link this with histological information or should we disconnect from the morphology and look at the function. Do you got any thoughts on that? Well, I don't think we can disconnect it from the histology because that's all we got currently. And it is among these many newer modalities, the only one that's been reasonably well validated. Although I like to point out that the NIDDK, which gets full credit for creating a NASH clinical network that has been following over 1,500 patients for many years, they defined a pathologic scoring system. But I like to point out that that scoring system was based the feedback Features, the three features of that scoring system that we know very well is the NAFLD activity score, which are the amount of ballooning, that funny kind of cell death, the amount of lobular inflammation, and the amount of fat. The reason those three parameters, among many others that pathologists could assess, were included in the NAFLD activity score is because they're the only three that the pathologists could agree on to any extent at all. The other features, that one would say, yeah, I think there's a lot of this, and the other pathologists would look at the same tissue and say, nah, nah, there's none of that there. So they said, well, let's pick the three that at least the two different observers can agree agree on. But no one had ever linked those three features to outcomes. And it turns out they don't correlate with outcomes. The only thing that correlates with outcomes in a biopsy is the amount of scar. And so it brings us back to, you know, my home base, which is fundamentally, we need to understand where the scar is coming from, how quickly it's being made, how it's regressed. And that's a whole other discussion, which we know very little about. To get back to your question, Jorn, we need to continue to ground ourselves in histology, albeit complementing it with digital pathology until we have something all the, all the more better. Now, you did mention something important, which is function. If lung doctors are treating a patient for pulmonary fibrosis, which is a very bad disease with a poor five-year survival, maybe 50% at best, but when they're following a patient in a clinical trial to see if a new drug is working, they don't biopsy the lung and say how much scar is there. They look at whether the patient can breathe better, whether they can walk longer in six minutes, whether their breathing tests get better. Those are all function tests. And here we are in the liver biopsying all these patients and sticking this needle in, you know, that's reasonably long uh, to obtain tissue. And yet the liver is such a rich functional organ. So I think rightfully, there's a lot of effort now to say, well, maybe what we should be measuring is the reserve function that the liver has and how much is that reserve being exhausted, whether it's to metabolize drugs or clear blood substrates or what have you. Maybe we ought to start looking at the function of the liver as a better predictor of who's responding to drug and who's going to live longer, better and feel better. Scott, First of all, this is fantastic. And I can follow it. For a guy whose last natural science course was high school biology, that's pretty good on your part. Well, I, I can get the stick figures out if you want, Roger, but I think we're doing okay. Uh, actually, actually, all you need to do is speak 
very slowly. No, in all seriousness, <laughs> as as I'm listening to this discussion about histopathology, I, I do this from time to time on this podcast, I'm reminded of Premarin. Premarin being a drug uh, synthesized from pregnant mare urine, which is where the name comes from. I think all of you know this. It was approved in 1939. At one point in time, sales were up well over a billion dollars a year, and yet nobody could ever make a generic of it. And the reason was because the biochemistry and the blood distribution of Premarin was so poor that nobody could match something that bad. Variability inherent in that drug made it impossible to genericize it. I sometimes worry about the same thing when we talk about histopathology for all the reasons you just discussed. You've got an NAS score, none of the variables of which correlate to outcome. You've got these really poor reader reliability scores where if when I was in marketing research, if I told a client that that was my reader reliability, I would have gotten fired immediately. Can, can you paint the picture for how we make the transition so that we don't wind up getting stuck like Premarin back in this bad histopathology forever? No easy answers because it's a little bit of a circular process, meaning people say, well, we want something that's better than biopsy. But how do you know if it's better than biopsy? Does it match what the biopsy shows you? So you're never going to escape this hamster wheel where you're predicating the power of your diagnostic to how good it matches to biopsy. The real acid test of how you get there, uh, which is easier said than done, is can I perform a new diagnostic test that actually predicts in five years who gets into trouble and who doesn't? And we're kind of getting there with a lot of these tests. Rather than start now at time zero and say, okay, let's draw this test now and wait 15 years. Well, of course, nobody's going to do that. But there are possibilities of getting banked blood for a blood test and going back and saying, you know, these 50 patients got into a whole lot of trouble from their liver disease over the next five or 10 years since we first tested them. Let's compare them to an equal number of patients who did get worse and see if the, the biomarker would have predicted who would get worse and who wouldn't. And there are tests that are sort of doing that. I was involved in a study as a co-author in a very lovely paper from actually Eugene Hoshida, who's a molecular biologist now at UT Southwestern, although he was on our faculty for some time. And he worked with historical samples that had been collected over many years by Massimo Colombo in Milano. And he knew which patients had gotten into trouble. And he had the biopsies from 10 years earlier. And what Eugene was able to show is that if you interrogated those tissues from 10 years and often 20 years earlier, there was a pattern of gene expression that predicted that some of these patients were going to get worse. So in many ways, those baby steps were already being being taken and in some cases limited success has you know proven the wisdom of not trying to peg everything back to how good it is at replicating biopsy but just leapfrogging over the biopsy altogether and trying to get something else that predicts outcomes yeah this is a huge issue you know getting beyond the biopsy is something that's imperative you know maybe I've said it here before on the podcast but if we can't find a way around this biopsy issue it has the potential to really set the field back because right now there's no merger and acquisitions happening in the field of NASH. The, the venture capital money is all on the sidelines. People are waiting to see if there's going to be a drug approved, if there really is a path forward. And if you look at where we are with liver biopsy, I mean, I think I'm struck by two things. One, this variability in response, and two, the placebo response. If you look at elafibrinor and obetacolic acid, at the two highest doses studied, the fibrosis response rate was equivalent, between 23 and 24 percent. The placebo response response rate is the only reason why OCA has moved forward, albeit they're struggling a bit, but hopefully they cross the finish line, and elafibrinor decided not to move forward with drug development. Are they really that much different in response? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. To your point, we've got to get to the point where we can use blood-based tests and imaging-based tests to predict an outcome and then predict response to therapy and also identify those at-risk NASH patients. And I think there's something to imaging uh, these stellate cells to get us closer to that answer, either in a blood-based test or in an imaging-based test or a combination of both, all looking at it through those the context of those three different contexts of use. We, we've not heard yet from Louise, and um, that's because this has been such a fast-moving and superb conversation. Louise, do you have anything you want to add, ask about? Well, the boys did such a good session, and they asked all the questions that I was going to ask, which um, obviously means I've been doing this podcast way too long. Stephen, Nick, my main question, just listening to Stephen and that there are on elafibrinor and ochre. Is there an opportunity to use all of these biopsies that's been obtained to do more stellite cell investigation to see whether or not they were just laden with patients that were unlikely to respond, given how they may have more of the wrong cells than the right cells or more of the badder of the bad in that way that predicts is it an opportunity for people to use all of those slides afterwards to work for the greater good? When I think about that, I think on platforms. 
long-form trials. If you've got all of those biopsies in studies that haven't done so well or have just made it across the line, whether or not you can use the technology rather than re-biopsy or go through next waves, take our strength. I'll take a shot at that and see if Scott has anything to add. I mean, I, I think for sure there are a lot of paired liver biopsies. There's a lot of baseline liver biopsies. There's a lot of screen failed liver biopsies. If we look at all the liver biopsy tissue that's been accumulated between all the phase 2B trials and all the phase 3 trials, and you, you incorporate all the screen fails with all those that, that were baseline and put on IP, we're talking over 10,000 liver biopsy specimens. And all of those have some blood work attached to them. Not all of them have stored serum, but a lot of them have stored serum that are still kind of hanging around. And we've been a little bit stovepiped in, in our approach to this. We have had discussions about bringing our baseline liver biopsies, our screen fail biopsies all together and mining them for what data we could get out of that, which would be, was there a blood test or an imaging test that links to severity of disease across thousands and thousands of patients? But I don't think we've considered it looking at it from the perspective that you just identified. I guess that's a question for Scott. Can we take liver biopsies that are paraffin embedded and do any type of stellate cell work on them? Or do you have to have biopsies frozen in RNA later or something like that for which you can do work? Uh, it depends on the technique. I can't say chapter and verse which techniques are dependent on fresh frozen tissue that hasn't been fixed in paraffin. But certainly there are techniques that have been around for over 10 years in which you can extract gene expression data from paraffin embedded samples. I guess part of the challenge is who pays for this? This is always part of the problem is, you know, the drug discovery and diagnostic fields are skewed towards companies that have the funds to pay to test them. And studies like the one you were describing are going to be a little bit of an orphan. Who's going to spend the money to pay for technicians to pull blocks out of the dusty old archives of a pathology department, slice them, stain them? It's the kind of thing where you hope that uh, and NIH and other funders will pay for because unless it can enhance the commercial viability or success of a diagnostic or a, a drug, it's going to be hard to find people with enough money to pay for those studies. But yes, they absolutely should be done. So we're about an hour in, which is usually when we take a look for final questions and time to wrap up. So let me start by asking your and Stephen Louise, any questions have come to mind or flesh through your head that we've not gotten around to and you want to make sure we touch on now? I, I guess my one question to Scott is how far are we off, Scott, to actually phenotype a patient with these technologies today? So I think some of them, as I mentioned, are already available. Most labs routinely genotype uh, individuals before they go on Plavix, for example, because it's a polymorphism. And Plavix is a platelet antagonist. So there is a polymorphism that predicts the Plavix won't be effective. So some of it is already being done, but just really piecemeal. You know, every time I estimate how long it's going to take, I think in the end, you need to double it. <laughs> So you know, I'm going to say optimistically, 10 years from now, we're going to have platforms that genotype patients and maybe divide them into subgroups. But I'm always, I don't want to say disheartened, but I'm always sobered by the reality of how long these kinds of studies take. Your guess is really as good as mine, Yorn and Stephen. I just have a, I don't know, maybe a very pragmatic question. When when can we expect the next great discovery paper or publication out of your lab, Scott? Oh, I've got some very cool stuff cooking. I have some wonderfully talented people in my lab. And I didn't really mention this in my career comments at the beginning, but I do want to emphasize that among the many job descriptions I have, perhaps the most satisfying over the long run has been mentor. And that's still the case. So I have some great stuff coming about how we think stellate cells behave differently in late versus early disease. Uh, also, how specific stellate cells remember that they were once activated. Some of that work is being presented by a really talented uh, junior faculty who was a postdoc in my lab, Sammy Wong. W-A-N-G. So her first name legally is Shuang, S-H-U-A-N-G. Have a look at her stuff that she will be presenting at ASLD in the coming weeks, and that'll give you a clue. But we're, we're still hot on the trail of these cell types, and obviously the more questions we get answered, the more new questions arise. I think it's cool. But of course, you know, I'm completely passionate and biased about the excitement of what we're doing. If I wasn't, I probably wouldn't be doing it. Yeah, I, think, I think to a person, the most gratifying and satisfying thing that we can do as clinician scientists is mentor. And to see those folks that we have had a hand in helping rise up and take on the mantle and carry it forward long after we're gone, that's so much more satisfying than anything we could do ourselves. So with that, noting that we probably could go on for another hour if we dove back into 
of content, and that's probably not doable right now. I'd like to do two things. First of all, Scott, I'd like to invite you to come back anytime, but really if we can maybe sometime in the winter, in, in the lull after Nashtag and before um, AS, uh, before Easel, to come back and, and revisit uh, what cool things have happened in the last three to four months and, and get all that in context. That would be fantastic. That would be a delight. I'm going to do, use basically the same question I used last week with a slight variant to make it a little bit less phantasmagorical. For everyone but Scott, the one most eye-opening thing you've heard in the last 45 minutes. And for Scott, the one thing you'd like our listeners to take out of this, and whoever wants to go first should just go first. I'm going to jump in first because I'm going to let the gentleman finish the session. I suppose for me, it was the whole thing of being able to potentially phenotype people so accurately that we can probably then concentrate the resources on the are likely to develop cirrhosis and fibrosis and leave the other ones to a lifestyle that suits them. To be able to put resources into the ones that are going to be affected by absolutely finite tuning that in the future fills me with great excitement. So thank you. It was fascinating. Well, there's so many things that were said and discussed. It's hard to identify one particular thing that's more important than the other. Just the thing that I, I'm walking away from today is, is just focusing in on how we can use this technology to advance our non-invasive testing strategy for, for diagnosis, monitoring response to therapy, and predicting outcomes. I think, Scott, you're on the heels of something great with this, with the technologies we have, the way we've rallied around NASH as a community and fibrosis more specifically. If we have the technology and we have the bandwidth and we have the, the knowledge we certainly have the patients. We should be able to put those together and advance this field relatively rapidly. So that that's what I'm excited about. You're in. With the emergence of new technologies, there come challenges. And I'm trying to think about how can I communicate this to a patient? How can I let them know? And, and how, how do I do this responsibly? What does this test mean for your prognosis and how should we treat it? And I, I see the complexity of it. And I'm very pleased to hear that there as IT support uh, to guide me as a technician, uh, as, a, as a clinician. It's just the complexity of the data that we're we're gathering in the future it makes it very important to give you know good recommendations to to patients and i'm looking forward to have more detailed information than just a tissue slide to discuss with my patients thanks for it. scott i'm going to go next and give you the last word my mind drifts towards different theories at moments like this and right now i'm drifting towards complexity theory right so a butterfly flaps its wings in chicago and three days later there are thunderstorms in chicago but that's overly simplified what it really is about is that there are moments where a piece of information or something will set you down a path and then you will get to a point that will bifurcate. And if you get set down the right path and you bifurcate in the right direction, something discontinuous and really bold happens. And listening to you and then last week to Lars also, I'm struck by the profusion of information, each piece of which is amazingly exciting, and wondering how anybody sorts out which piece is more likely to be that one that turns into the discontinuous innovation that makes everybody go, aha. I obviously don't have an answer. I don't know the subject matter well enough, but it strikes me that whoever figures that out or who whichever groups of people figure that out, the further ahead we are. And labs with lots of good mentors like yours have a, have a leading edge on that, I think. But how does that all get resolved? Well, I left my crystal ball at home, Roger, so I can't answer directly. But maybe what I will say as a counterpoint to that is that I'm exceedingly hopeful in the long run. And I draw on the experience that we've seen in the specialty that Stephen and Jorn will know well. You know, when I was a fellow, we had four liver treatments, Lactulose, Lasix, Prednisone, and Aldactone, which are really not liver treatments at all. They're water pills, diuretics, and, and anti-inflammatory. You know, fast forward to 2021, of course, we have liver transplantation. We have living donor liver transplantation. We have cures of hep C, outstanding treatments of hep E. We have new treatments for uh, allergies. I just am absolutely confident that these efforts that are ongoing, some of which we've discussed, and many of which you and Stephen are involved in, are going to yield fruit. And we won't really appreciate it as much unless we look in hindsight to where we were, just as I can look at, you know, hep C, which was non-A, non-B in the 80s, then the virus is discovered. And from the time the virus was discovered in 89, it took the better part of 30 years to get a cure. And that was a single virus that had all the obvious targets. Unfortunately, it's not soon enough. I can say that without hesitation because our patients need it now. They're not, they're not comforted by the fact that we'll have progress 20 years from now, nor should they be. But still, I, I'm extremely optimistic that piece by piece, we're going to sort of stitch this together and, you know, create a brighter future. I don't know if it's going to be a eureka kind of, oh, wow, this changes everything moment, Roger, or if it's going to be incremental that needs to be appreciated more in retrospect than in prospect. But uh, optimistic still I am. Uh, that, you know, the truth of the 
matter is I could listen to you for hours. And and that's, that's without trombones and tubas. I could listen for hours. I, I kind of don't want this to end. And it, I've realized that it has to. First of all, Scott, thank you for joining us today. And this has really been fantastically illuminating. Thank you, Jorn, Stephen, Louise, for some for great questions. Stephen, thank you for pushing me again, as with last week, to say that this was something so important that we had to do as quickly as we could, because I just think this is, is a fantastic hour. And I think the, our listeners will get a ton out of it. Yeah, I just want to say th thanks to Scott for coming on and, and being a part of this podcast. Your work is, is seminal in the field, and it's important to be able to share that with our growing audience. And Jorn and Louise for staying up till all hours of the night to be a part of this. And it's just, uh, it means a lot to me. And, and, and thank you for that. Well, it's an honor to be part of this. And I you just m mentioned the date and I'll be back. To flip that, it's I'm honored that you think it's an honor. That's great. Okay. <laughs> back at you. And with that, Jorn, Louise, get some rest. Uh, Stephen, Scott, thank you very much. I'll be back in a minute with business section. Thanks, everybody. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We'll be back next week to review the Paris Nash meeting. Once more, before we go, condolences to the UK, the Commonwealth, and everyone else around the world who considered Elizabeth your queen. This truly was a loss for the entire world and for the ages. Hopefully, next week will be less tumultuous, easier to deal with. In the meantime, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now.